Funding for this program is provided by Trustees of the New York Historical Society. We're here tonight at the Robert H. Smith Auditorium at New York Historical Society to have a conversation with my friend Jack Farrell about our 37th President of the United States, Richard M. Nixon. And Jack, tell me about Richard Nixon's childhood um, growing up in Southern California. What, what was it like for him as a boy? It's amazing because uh, I went uh, into this project with the uh, preconception that everything in California um, is uh, astonishingly wonderful. And in fact, um, he came from the outback of California. Um, it, uh, the, the pictures of uh, his father's lemon ranch um, outside of Yorba Linda, show this desolate plain with uh, uh, rattlesnakes and uh, tumbling weeds. Um, and every once in a while, the Santa Ana winds would blow down, and they'd all have to actually, like the scene from The Wizard of Oz, go down into this, in the storm cellar. It was, it was so bad. Um, two of his brothers die um, in his childhood. The little baby dies of a, a meningitis within a week, Arthur, with these golden curls, um, Dick's favorite brother. And then... Harold, the oldest brother, the, uh, um, the shining star of the family, uh, contacts tuberculosis, and he takes a long time um, to die. And the family takes its meager savings into trying to get Harold treatment. And so even though Dick Nixon gets accepted into Harvard and Yale um, and gets a scholarship for the tuition, his family could not afford to send him back across the country and to board him in Cambridge or, or New Haven. So it really was almost a Dickensian um, childhood, and it explains, I think, a lot of that quirkiness, that awkwardness that he had as an adult. Was he called Dick as a boy? That was his name? Well, his mother always called him Richard um, and told his teachers that he was going to be Richard. She was a very severe uh, woman. Um, she was a, a Quaker, and she would retreat into her closet, close the door um, to pray. And as Nixon once famously said, my, ne my mother never once in my life told me that um, she loved me. It was just not our way. And if you look at the uh, David Frost interviews, um, he's asked at one point, and he makes this amazing confession that no other American president, I don't think, would ever make or has ever made, which is that he tells David Frost, he says, I'm basically an unlovable individual. And that's what he carried around with him. But this gave him the ability, this, this amazing political ability to understand the grievances of his audience and to tap it because he, Richard, suffered it, that, that affliction himself. I'm wondering, did he, did he read a lot about presidents when he was young? And would you consider him an intellectual? Yes, he, he did read a lot. He was an intellectual, but sort of a, um, a, a, a again, I keep coming back to the word quirky, a quirky type of intellectual. Um, there's a, a famous story of uh, the comeback, Richard Nixon. After he'd left office, some of you might remember that he, he began to sort of start sending these memos to presidents and, and organizing um, a, a new reputation as this foreign policy um, savant who would give advice. Um, and then he started having these um, dinners at his home in New Jersey. And uh, Roger Stone, strangely enough, <laughs> was the man who organized them. And he would call the, the top political reporters of the day. And they would go there, and they'd arrive at this house. And the house was decorated with um, Chinese tapestry and Chinese pottery to remind the reporters about the, the uh, opening to China. Um, and then they would eat. They would eat this exquisite Chinese cuisine. And then Nixon would stand up, and everybody would quiet down. And he would give this amazing talk about everything that's going on in the world and in American politics. And it seemed so spontaneous and, and brilliant. Uh, but our friend John Alter of Newsweek uh, found that nature was calling. And so he went upstairs to go to the bathroom. And as he walked down this hall, there was on, the side, on a sideboard, there was a, a yellow legal pad. And he found that every word that Nixon had just said at the table, which seemed spontaneous, had been written down ahead of time and rehearsed and memorized. And so that kind of intellectual power Nixon had, but he didn't have any kind of spontaneity in dealing with another human, human being. And of course, we know this because of the White House tapes. You just listen to him awkwardly thrashing about 
Um, just briefly, World War II, what did Nixon do? Nixon was one of an amazing group of future American leaders who was in the Solomon Islands. And that included JFK on PT-109. It included Joe McCarthy, Senator Joe McCarthy. It included Ben Bradley, the editor of the Washington Post. John Mitchell, who would become Nixon's um, attorney general. Uh, and they all were in this one theater. And while some of them had very dashing jobs, like Lieutenant Kennedy, um, Nixon was in charge of um, organizing supply uh, airlifts so that the Marines would go in and they would seize an island. And Nixon would come in right afterwards um, with the CBs. They would create an airfield and then he, Nixon would be in charge of choreographing the airplanes coming in with supplies and ammunition and taking the wounded out. You mentioned Joe McCarthy. Um, so what is the relationship like with Joe McCarthy? The short answer is that he was sort of John the Baptist. Uh, for Joe McCarthy. Yeah. And did he consider himself a McCarthyite in any way, Nixon? It's pure pragmatism for him because um, out of nowhere he gets plucked to become Eisenhower's vice president and Eisenhower is counseled by many people on his staff saying you've got you to stomp on Joe, he's, he's, he's destroying the country and Nixon is the one who's telling Eisenhower, he may be, you know, rough and you know, abusive, but this is a great issue for the Republican Party. And it, made, it got me elected to the Senate in California. You picked me to be vice president. And so he was constantly, within the Eisenhower White House, a defender of Joe McCarthy. And, uh, and he was uh, very, very uh, upset and depressed when McCarthy was finally destroyed because finally Eisenhower turned against him. Eight years, he was Dwight Eisenhower's vice president. What would you like people to know about Nixon as vice president? How influential, how powerful was he? Um, it was a complicated relationship because Nixon adored Eisenhower. He wanted to think of himself as a, as a partner. Eisenhower had been dealing with Stalin, Truman, Roosevelt, Churchill. Um, and to, to Ike, Dick Nixon was staff. He was like a young major or lieutenant who was on the, the Supreme Commander's staff in World War II. Nice kid, you know, has some promise, um, but in no way ready to be president of the United States. Uh, and then Ike has a heart attack. And uh, again, with Nixon, it's and yet. Um, and Nixon performs superbly. Thrown into this crisis, he shows tact. He's deft when he calls on the on the cabinet members, he goes to their offices, never takes a step inside the, uh, the Oval Office, um, and he thinks that this has now earned him a spot for the second term, and despite this, or maybe even because of this, Eisenhower decides to drop him from the ticket. And so there's this awful time for Nixon where for six months he's dangled, dangling in the wind, um, and finally uh, Eisenhower relents, uh, and he gets to serve a second term. Could Eisenhower have done more in 1960 when, once Nixon got the GOP nomination uh, for president? There's uh, stories that I was lukewarm about Nixon. Did you, did you find that to be true? It was, it's a complicated story because Ike had this bad heart. And when he went out on the campaign trail and began to campaign for Nixon, uh, Ike's doctor called Mamie, Ike's the first lady, and said, you got to stop him. He's, you know, he, he's had a couple of episodes. We've got to bring him back. And so rather than confront Ike, um, Mamie went to Pat, who went to Dick, um, and they limited Eisenhower's schedule. Now on the other side, Jack Kennedy is telling people and writing memos that Eisenhower is absolutely killing us. He's the single most effective thing um, Republicans have going in the last few weeks of the, of the election. Um, and so for Nixon to do this on behalf of Eisenhower um, was actually a, a, an honorable thing. Uh, but it always went down in Eisenhower's mind because he didn't know what had gone on behind the scenes as this amazingly stupid move by Nixon not to use me where I could have been most effective. So in 1960, it's this extraordinary moment for televised presidential debates, and many people thought that Jack Kennedy won the election because of television and the way he performed on those. Did Nixon, you in your estimation make a blunder by agreeing to debate Kennedy on TV? Yes. Because there was not a long tradition, he could have gotten, he could have ducked it. Again, poor Richard, um, he uh, was campaigning and he banged his knee 
It got infected. He was in a hospital bed for two weeks. And part of the reason that he looked so unfortunate in that debate against Kennedy was that um, he had a temperature of 103. He had this infection in his knee. Um, he had lost all this weight, so his, his collar was, was, was sticking out. Of course, he had that propensity to um, perspire. And you look at that first debate, and Jack Kennedy looks like a million bucks. Now, after Nixon loses in 1960, he also reengages in California politics. Not very successful, but by 1968, we've got the new Nixon, yep. and he's able to get that the Republican nomination in a year that is so tumultuous with yep. you know the deaths of Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy and Democrats in Chicago aflame. How what did Nixon do between 1961? and 68 procuring the, the Republican nomination to establish himself to have the street cred yeah. to um, pull it off in, in 68? The, the short answer is that he went to work for a New York law firm <laughs> representing Pepsi <laughs> overseas. Um, the long answer is that he used this opportunity of going around to the world's capitals on behalf of Pepsi uh, to meet with the ambassador, meet with the foreign leaders he had known as vice president. And he used it basically as a six-year seminar on foreign policy. And in 1967, and you can read this, it's online, um, he writes a piece called uh, Asia After Vietnam. And folks, if you want to see the good side of Dick Nixon, the visionary side, read that piece because he talks about a changing world, a different world, where the monolithic communist regimes with their five-year plans and their uh, factory workers are going to be left far behind because there's this new thing coming called the computer. And there's going to be a new age called the information age. And it's going to require liberty and suppleness and freedom of movement. And the communist giants will not be able to cope with it. And you're going to see all these young tiger countries on the rim of Asia um, arising. Um, and the one great risk to all this is China. China, if China is allowed to sit behind its walls, then they could emerge 20 years after and, and spoil it all. So at some point, they have to be brought into the, uh, uh, the family of nations, the international order. And the first week that he's in office, he calls Kissinger in, and he says, you know those desultory talks that have been going on in Warsaw between the United States and, and, uh, and China? Start them up again. And don't tell anybody, but this, between you and me, this is a priority. 1968, civil rights, and in fact, the whole, all the Nixon presidency, civil rights is a big backdrop. Uh, if you listen to the Nixon tapes, you'll hear Nixon slur African Americans, Native Americans, but also people from India and Pakistan. Yeah. He's an equal opportunity <laughs> bigot in a way. On yeah. the, but do you think he was racist, Richard Nixon? No, and, and you know, again, you have to just keep coming back to his, you know, pragmatism is a nice way of saying it, opportunism is the other way. Um, in 1957, the first civil rights bill is moving through Congress, and there is no greater backer in Washington, D.C. than Richard Nixon. First vice president to go visit a, a black family um, in their home, goes to a cocktail party of, of, of black uh, journalists, um, befriends Martin Luther King fights on the Senate floor for a stronger civil rights bill against both Lyndon Johnson and Jack Kennedy, who wanted to water it down. But three years later in 1960, Martin Luther King gets arrested in Georgia. And it's the Kennedys who make the phone call to the judge to get Martin Luther King released. And Dick Nixon, who says, no comment. Um, Nixon had decided that, um, that the way to play the card in 60 was the other way. Um, and uh, there's plenty of evidence in Nixon's private papers that he was not a bigoted man. Um, private letters that he writes to people talking about civil rights. But when given the opportunity to further the career of Dick Nixon, um, he, he went for the, uh, the easy and the darker way. Now also in 68, 69, women's movement, uh, full force. What is his marriage? to Pat Nixon like? Did he ever commit adultery or was he a <laughs> philanderer? Is this a loyal, functioning marriage um, that there, there's lo Boy, love a, was self-evident? Uh, the great revelation to me doing the book was, was um, Patricia Ryan Nixon. Um, she became my heroine. Um, amazing woman, great sense of humor, great 
sardonic, sarcastic sense of humor, saw through all the blarney of, of Washington and saw what politics could do to her, to her husband. Um, and you can go out and you can read Dick's love letters to her uh, back in the uh, 19, late 1930s. Um, dearest, dearest Pat, um, this, uh, this uh, young barrister is sitting at his desk and the rains have ended and the sun has come out and a rainbow stretches towards uh, the mountains um, and all he can do is think of uh, his beautiful uh, red-haired Irish vagabond and I mean really obviously he was head over heels and he, and he chased her and convinced her to become his wife and they made at the beginning um, a great team but she, she saw what politics could do to him and there was an estrangement there in the, in the Eisenhower years. She never wanted him to run for president. She went along with it. There are patchy reports that from time to time Nixon may have felt, had too many drinks and felt frisky, um, but certainly nothing to compare with uh, JFK's record yeah, no. in the White House. <laughs> Not that many could. So, she stuck with him through Watergate. They went back to San Clemente and, um, and uh, hammered out some kind of a life. Uh, the, the, both of the daughter's marriages um, were stable. They had a bunch of grandchildren. And so there was a little bit of a, a happy ending. Now, the big story, of course, 69 to 74, the Vietnam War. Um, what was Nixon's strategy once he got elected? And how did he execute um, the, all the battle fronts in yeah. Southeast Asia? Well, the first thing he did was torpedo Johnson's peace talks right before Election Day in 1968, which I, in the book, argue is the most reprehensible thing um, that he did, far worse than anything um, in, in Watergate. Once he got into office, I think he made um, his, his biggest strategic mistake. Now, you can argue that this, he argued that this war was maintained for four more years to buy time for those Asian tiger economies to get off the ground and, and begin to go, to give him time to make the approach to China and drive this wedge between the Soviet Union and the Red Chinese who were, who were, who were at odds with each other. But in the end, he got nothing more than he could have gotten if he had um, cut a deal in the first six months in office where it was a democratic war. He could have gone to the country and said, you know, I, I told you I had a peace plan. Here's my peace plan. Um, it, it may require the sacrifice of um, South Vietnamese independence and some sort of long, drawn-out process. Um, and he didn't do it, and instead we got um, Cambodia. And we got more explosives dropped on North Vietnam than um, uh, American forces dropped around the world, including the two atomic bombs um, in World War II. Did he have a conscience about all of the the um, dead American soldiers, but also this indiscriminate bombing in Cambodia, North Vietnam, and the, the mounting death toll. Is there any historical evidence of him grieving about that fact? Now, there's a great clip on the White House tapes where he talks about a trip that he once took in a car with Eisenhower, and Eisenhower talked about the massive bombing of, 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 of Western Europe. And Nixon equated the North Vietnamese with the Nazis and you know, said it's war, it's justified, and that's how um, he got by. The tapes are very ugly. They're, um, they're ugly in, in race, they're awful ugly on anti-Semitism, um, and, they're, and they're very ugly in just the callousness of um, the, sort of the lack of any kind of voiced human emotion. Um, about any of these actions he, that he, he takes. starts taping himself, Nixon in 1971. Um, there was a, and these are voice activated, which is different than John F. Kennedy taping a phone call yeah. with the world leader or Lyndon Johnson. Meaning he's he's basically <laughs> bugging his own offices, and all the little banter gets, um, you know, um, played out. And now it's a permanent historical record, and I think damages Nixon yeah. the tapes. Um, but why did he decide to just tape everything? <laughs> uh, he was a klutz. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you can listen to the first couple of tapes where Haldeman comes in 
and says, well, Mr. President, this is the taping system, and you push this button. This button? No, no, you push this button over here. Oh, this button. No, no, actually, you don't have to push any buttons because it's going to be voice activated. But if you want to turn it off, then you push this button. This button. No, no, Mr. President. Um, and, and so he just, um, they did it voice activated because they couldn't trust him to be able to do what Johnson and JFK did, which is turn it on at the right moment and turn it off when you're doing it. <laughs> and, and that was a cutting edge new technology for that era of having this voice activated taping system. And he right? became a junkie about it. He had him put it up in his study, he put it over in his hideaway office. Um, all the phone calls, thank God, are much, which are much clearer than um, some of the uh, um, uh, hideaway office tapes. Um, all the phones were bugged, Camp David. Um, very briefly, just a couple of accomplishments of Nixon. Um, the Environmental Protection Agencies created by him in 1970. That wasn't his thing, the uh, environment, but yet he's the, the progenitor of yeah. EPA. Why did Nixon create the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970? Maybe some of you remember, uh, 50 years ago, there was a huge oil spill off the coast of um, California, Santa Barbara oil spill. Um, and he, this was like the first week in office. And he went out there and he saw what happened. And he, you know, he was a Southern Californian. He had a love for the land. And so um, it wasn't all politics. But then he came back and his aide started saying, environment, environment, Muskie's going to use the environment against you. Scoop Jackson's going to use the environment against you. And he began to think more and more in those terms. And so rather than wait for Congress to do anything, he, by executive order, he creates the environmental protection agency with an executive order. Just sign the piece of paper and there you have it. And then followed it up later with signing off on clean air and water legislation, True. endangered species. And, and this was not just an empty gesture. The guys that he put in charge of the EPA, the first two administrators, were dedicated. And what about the Apollo 11 going to the moon, Neil Armstrong? Did, how engaged was he and what did that mean for his presidency? Nixon was torn. Um, the Apollo program went, was very, very expensive. Um, and uh, the war was very expensive, and the economy was, um, w was teetering uh, as he was approaching um, uh, re-election in 1972. And Apollo was a Jack Kennedy thing. And, and to his credit, Nixon also believed that the technology of space shots was not transferable, whereas the technology of, of um, uh, space stations and shuttles would help the American aeronautical industry better, uh, more. Um, so he, he basically, he took all the credit for the moonshot. He went and he greeted the astronauts when they um, uh, came back and basked in the limelight while very quietly, um, you know, ending our adventure on the moon and, and um, going to the shuttle program. And obviously the big thing we haven't talked about really is Watergate. Can we detach Watergate from Nixon's legacy and, and what would have been like minus Watergate? Yeah, I think that, uh, again, with the exception of what I think was a disastrous Vietnam policy, um, and that was not his war, that was something he inherited, uh, that he would be rated extremely highly by um, American uh, historians of the future. Uh, if you look at the lists that are made now, uh, Nixon's somewhere in the 20s, which as the only president to, be, to resign in disgrace, that's not bad, I mean, if, if, you, if you think about it. Um, domestically, I think he'll be looked at as the third president of the New Frontier Great Society because so many things that began in the Johnson and Kennedy administrations came to fruition when the country was still backing this liberal consensus and Nixon signed them. Um, and, there's, and some of them are just, I mean, astonishing. You know, the internet, nobody had any idea what it was, but it actually began on Nixon's, on Nixon's watch. Expanded Social Security and put the, uh, the Social Security colas in for the first time, cost of living uh, raises in for the first time. Um, uh, integrated the Southern schools to an extent that no Democratic president ever did. I mean, there's, a, there's an awful lot. The only thing that he gets credit for that I, that I have to chuckle about, you asked about, about his relationship with women, is that yes, he did indeed sign the bill that had Title IX in it, but he did so kicking and screaming because Nixon was, of course, this great football guy, and he, his best friends were Bear Bryant and Woody Hayes and Father Harrisburg from Notre Dame. And when they heard that, that there was this bill that was gonna give women equal parity with their football programs, they called their friend Dick Nixon in the White House. And Nixon tried every way to get out of signing that bill, but in the end he signed it, and there on the wall of the Nixon Library, it's one of his accomplishments. <laughs>
does Nixon still hold the title as most um, corrupt president? Well, uh, and was he really the most corrupt president, or can't we can we ju make a judgment like that? I don't think he, you can make that judgment. And, and his you know his corruption was of a special kind. It was a paranoia because he couldn't trust himself because he had this awful self-image. He couldn't trust that the American people would, would do the right thing and reward him for all his hard efforts. And so he felt he had to rig the game. Um, and I think that's where the, the Watergate corruption um, uh, came from. Um, and, uh, and it was, you know, in, in fairness to him, he was occupied with uh, getting off the gold standard, um, uh, running for re-election, uh, strategic arms treaty with the Soviet Union and going to China at the same time that this insane bozo, Gordon Liddy, was dreaming up these schemes of, you know, having prostitutes lure Democratic delegates onto houseboats where, you know, they'd be photographed and blackmailed. I mean, just crazy comic book stuff. He launched the notion that we have to play dirty, we have to play hard, and then didn't supervise his little guys who went out and did all these things that brought him down. It's a wonderful way to end. This is an amazing biography of Richard Nixon. And Jack Farrell, we could talk to you for another hour, but you did great. Thank you. Funding for this program was provided by trustees of the New York Historical Society.